chapter thirty of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty the narrative returns to its heroine and follows her and her interesting family to philadelphia a new and important friendship is formed there while mrs allen barnaby devotes herself to her new acquaintance the rest of the family indulge themselves by a visit to the theatre on reaching the little village of shakespeare town at which it was the purpose of major allen barnaby to embark he had the considerable satisfaction of hearing that no steamer for new york was expected to stop there for a day or two he therefore dismissed the conveyances so zealously lent for the use of his beloved and suffering wife and her family wrote a few affectionate lines to mrs beauchamp stating that though violent spasms had returned on the road the precious object of his care was again so far relieved as to encourage the delightful hope that the final result would be favourable and then shut himself up with his suffering angel at the hotel reiterating very audible orders on all sides that notice should be given them at whatever hour of the day or night a steamer bound for new york direct should reach the station during the extremely comfortable little tete-a-tete supper which followed for the negro attendants and their horses were to repose for that night at shakespeare town which rendered it necessary that the every way interesting invalid should confine herself to her chamber a discussion arose between the major and his wife as to the necessity of keeping patty in the dark respecting the real state of the case the major was of opinion that it would be better for her morality that she should continue to live in ignorance of his peculiar mode of playing cards as well as the extraordinary facility with which her mother could seem the thing she was not but mrs allen barnaby did not altogether agree with him as to her knowing no more than you choose to tell her donny about your rules of play i have no objection though after all you know her ignorance or innocence as you call it must depend altogether on her husband he's up to everything and if he should choose to live on the same pleasant confidential terms with his wife as you do with me donny i don't see how he can interfere to prevent it but patty's no fool and not a bit more likely to make a fuss about nothing than her mother was before her but with all this we have nothing to do and for you my dear you must just tell or not tell as much as you like but for my own part of the business i have made up my mind as i always have done throughout my whole life to act in strict conformity to my principles and nobody in my opinion can be in any degree worthy of esteem who does otherwise i have always endeavoured my dear major to impress on the mind of our daughter that it is a woman's duty to sacrifice everything for the interest of her husband and as far as i am concerned i shall merely tell patty that you had had enough of big gang bank and requested me to facilitate your departure in any manner i could devise and of course i shall add that in conformity to the unvarying line of conduct which i marked out for myself from the first hour of my becoming a wife i instantly feigned illness as being at once the most prompt and the most effectual mode of complying with your wishes well my dear that is all very right and proper replied the major and no man i am sure could find in his heart to say a word against it but suppose she should take it into her head wife to ask what it was that put it into my head to be in such a monstrous hurry to get off what should you tell her i do love the girl and i don't want her to think me worse than i am and upon my honour and life my dear what happened the other night the accident i mean upon which the luck turned was just exactly nothing so i think if you please that if she should take a fancy for questioning you the best thing to do will be just to refer her to me saying you know in your own charming manner which i am sure gives the finest example that ever girl had that it was enough for you to know that i wanted to be off and that you didn't care three farthings or something like that you understand whether you went or whether you stayed provided i was pleased and then if she wants to know more of course she will come to me and i don't much fear but what i shall find something or other to tell her that will set her mind at rest this point being satisfactorily adjusted the truly conjugal couple retired to rest and when the major sallied forth the next morning he had the satisfaction of finding his black cortege all ready to depart and only waiting to receive the very latest account respecting the health of the missus this was given in such a manner as while it sustained hope left no room for surprise at the too prompt recovery of the assassinated authoress and then the carriages and their guard of honour retreated leaving the major and his charming helpmate at liberty to rejoice at their ease at the perfect success of a stratagem which had enabled them to escape from an embarrassment that might have proved not a little perplexing now for it exclaimed mrs allen barnaby as she watched from her bedroom window the last of the three vehicles disappearing behind the trees 
now my dear let us look after patty and settle all together what we had better do next we will settle my dear replied her polite husband as soon as you please but as to our doing it all together i see no need of that neither the don nor his lady as i take it will make any objection to follow let us move which way we will i am decidedly for philadelphia said the lady and i with grief i confess it am decidedly against it responded the gentleman but i will give you an excellent reason for it there is no high play at philadelphia and that is precisely the excellent reason for which you ought to go there rejoined mrs allen barnaby why was it if you please that we made such a forced march from our snug quarters at the beauchamps and why did i consent to lie for the best part of two days like a sick dog in a basket wasn't it wholly and solely for the purpose of your removing yourself my good mr major from the place where a certain mr themistocles joseph john hapford you see i have not forgotten the precious name to which i am to owe my darling dollars was likely to find you and where i should like to know would he be so little apt to look for you as in a city where there is no high play going on i hope i shall never be such a fool wife as to fix downright upon anything without first taking your judgment upon it said the major with energy you most decidedly are what our admirable friends have called first-rate philadelphia then let it be i'll go and mystify patty a little but i think i shall only say i was tired and got you for fun to play sick because i wanted to be off there is no need to frighten her you know and make her fancy that every bush she sees is a constable running after me but stop one minute returned his wife just tell me before you go whether you mean to take what the ladies here call a spell of boarding or whether you shall prefer going into private lodgings as you will my dear replied the major who certainly became more and more convinced every day of his life that his wife was one of the cleverest women in the world i really had much rather that you should settle that point yourself then we will board major she replied with her usual decision of purpose as we are absolutely without letters or introductions of any kind it is necessary now as it was at first that we should get where setting ourselves off a little will turn to account the major kissed his hand to her and walked off saying as he went bravissimo you are the best trump my dear that ever fell to my share and now i'll go and do what is needful with our patty and then give orders that notice shall be given us when the first steamer for philadelphia arrives nothing could be more prosperous than the little voyage which partly by river and partly by sea brought my heroine and her amiable family to philadelphia they had made themselves sufficiently agreeable on board the steamboat to have obtained a good deal of useful local information in return for the answers they had thought proper to give in the national cross-examination to which as a matter of course they had been subjected during the voyage the name and all other particulars relative to the most fashionable boarding-house in the city made part of this and they immediately made use of it by ordering their baggage to be conveyed at once to number blank chestnut street following themselves on foot on inquiring for the mrs simcoe whom they had been instructed to ask for as the head of the establishment they were ushered through an exquisite neat hall to a large handsome parlour at the back of the house at the moment they entered it was unoccupied save by the glossy furniture which shone with all the brightness that horsehair and mahogany can show when not a single particle of dust is permitted to tarnish its brilliance it's a clean place at any rate observed the major but the sofa is not half so soft and comfortable as those at new orleans or at the beauchamps either exclaimed patty very nearly getting a fall by sliding off the firmly stuffed and treacherously sloping imitation of a couch upon which she had thrown herself at full length with her usual vivacity i can't say i overmuch like the style of it said mrs allen barnaby the things all look as if they were set out more for show than use the don said nothing but he took the liberty of looking about him and his pale yellow nose assumed an attitude between his black moustaches which expressed sufficiently well a feeling of distaste and discomfort but ere another word could be uttered by any of them the door was opened and a lady appeared at it whose aspect must have had something in it calculated to inspire respect for patty actually put her legs off the sofa and sat upright the person who inspired this unusual sensation in the breast of the lively bride was a quaker lady of about forty years of age with a countenance as beautiful as very small features of exquisite regularity and a complexion as delicate in its pink and white as the blossom of the eglantine could make it 
her dress was perfect in its kind being composed of fawn-coloured silk and snowy lawn of the best quality and arranged with such exceeding neatness that one might have fancied a quaker fairy had been her tire-woman so guiltless of the contamination of human fingers did she look she bent her pretty little head four times successively while her light blue eyes which shone with a sort of gentle moonlight gleam from beneath the smooth bands of her flaxen hair were directed in turn to each of the party we have been recommended to this house for boarding said mrs allen barnaby in a tone a little less peremptory than was usual with her may i ask who it was that sent thee demanded the gentle quaker upon my word ma'am i don't know the name of the gentleman replied my heroine a little offended perhaps at the doubt or the caution which the question seemed to indicate but perhaps you know the name of colonel beauchamp we have been staying with him and his lady for a long visit and if you know anything about them that must be quite recommendation enough i suppose no doubt of it friend if i chance to know them but i do not and thee canst understand that this makes all the difference replied mrs simcoe in a voice the bland tones of which seemed greatly less suited to express doubt than welcome well ma'am there are people enough to take dollars when they're offered without our wasting our time to find out whether you know our friends or not i think we had better go somewhere else major said mrs allen barnaby looking exceedingly indignant what must we do with the baggage mrs simcoe said a white help opening the door and presenting a face and figure as unlike those of her mistress as possible what rooms are the porters to carry it into this appeal caused mrs simcoe to look forth into the hall and it may be that the sight of the abundant packages assembled there suggested the idea that the lady's boast of being well furnished with dollars had something better to support it than any acquaintance however intimate with all the colonels in the union and having gently said to her handmaiden thee bide a bit she returned into the parlour and addressing like all other americans when doing business the principal gentleman of the party instead of the principal lady she said thee art welcome to remain here for a spell if such be thy wish friend my terms are eight dollars a week for each person provided they occupy the best rooms six if they take the second best and five if they content themselves with the third the bargain was soon made and the party established under the very respectable roof of mrs simcoe at the rate of six dollars a week for each of them having seen the various trunks and boxes disposed of in her own room and in that of her daughter mrs allen barnaby seated herself in a commodious armchair and began to meditate upon their new position and the mode in which her genius might be now best employed for the benefit of herself and family the major had walked out into the town to find which were the most frequented coffee-houses and to pick up whatever intelligence he might be able to meet floating about the dawn was gone with him and patty had proclaimed her intention of lying down on the bed till dinner-time so that the speculations of my heroine were not likely to be interrupted in any way she soon found however that she wanted a carte du pays and that there could be little profit in devising schemes while the circumstances and peculiarities of those to be acted upon remained unknown to her mrs allen barnaby was probably not the first person who when wishing for a precise knowledge of men and things has had recourse to servants for assistance having puzzled herself for a minute or two as to the best means of finding out what sort of people they were got amongst she suddenly started up and rang the bell it was not answered by the white help whom she had already seen but by an exceedingly well-dressed negress having the steady aspect of an old and respectable servant dear me exclaimed mrs allen barnaby i thought there were no blacks here as servants ma'am there are more blacks than whites replied the woman do step in for a moment and shut the door said the lady in an accent of familiar kindness tell me what is your name will you my name is ariadne ma'am said the negress demurely bless me what a fine name but i wish ariadne you would just tell me something about the company you have got in the house and about yourselves too i am quite glad to find blacks again here for then i suppose there will be no occasion to change i mean to say that the people think much the same here as elsewhere about it how many slaves has mrs simcoe got slaves ma'am said ariadne while a considerable portion of anger flashed from her eyes the philadelphia folks know better than that thank god we have got no slaves here dear me how very odd i thought all black people were slaves said the puzzled traveller you will know better than that ma'am when you have been a little longer in a free state replied the woman frowning i am as free as mrs simcoe herself ma'am and so are all the rest of us added the offended negress moving towards the door 
don't go away in a huff like that i'm sure i didn't mean to offend you my good woman said mrs allen barnaby coaxingly you must remember ariadne that i am just come from carolina and that i never heard there of any blacks that were not slaves so don't let's quarrel about that but just tell me a little about the ladies and gentlemen that are boarding here have they none of them got any slaves or plantations no ma'am said the woman sternly they'd scorn such wickedness one and all of them well to be sure that is queer after all i have heard and in the very same identical country too if that isn't enough to puzzle a traveller i wonder what is returned mrs allen barnaby adding in a mutter when at rome we must do as the romans do i suppose and so i must pitch my voice for singing another tune she then proceeded with a good deal of her usual cleverness to examine and cross-examine the woman till she had made out pretty tolerably to her satisfaction what style and order of people composed the party at the boarding-table at which they were about to take their places and having learned all she could on the subject she dismissed the negress first presenting her with a levy in token of her gratitude she then sought her daughter's apartment which was at no great distance from her own patty was lying on the bed fast asleep but as time pressed mrs allen barnaby could not yield to her maternal tenderness by permitting her to sleep on but felt absolutely compelled to arouse her to the necessary duty of dressing for dinner patty grumbled and scolded and indeed scrupled not to tell her attentive mamma that she was a great brute for waking her but no such trifle as this could move the steadfast spirit of her high-minded parent don't lay there abusing me there's a darling but wake up this very minute and dress yourself was her reply and mind patty she added that you dress yourself very carefully and very decently if you please don't put on that fine showy low dress that you wore the other day with the blue and pink bows because i happen to know perfectly well that it won't do here i shouldn't wonder i can tell you if we should be turned out of the house in no time stuff and nonsense replied the lately married lady i shall wear exactly what i like best i promise you ma'am so you had better not bother me with any more such vagaries i shall certainly desire tornorino to bid you hold your tongue if you do tornorino may chance to have the worst of it my darling returned her mother with the utmost good humour so good-bye dearest and wear your dark green gown and a high collar there's a love with these words mrs allen barnaby retreated leaving her daughter not only very angry but very much puzzled her don had already been throwing out hints respecting the probability that her respectable papa might get into a scrape or two if he did not mind what he was about and had also declared that he should not be at all surprised if it ended by their being obliged to shift for themselves and that he would not mind setting about it to-morrow if they could only screw a few hundred dollars out of the old folks to all of which madame tornorino had paid very little attention supposing it the result of some trifling dispute or other that no ways concerned either her own comfort or her own interest but now that she heard her mother talk of their being turned out of the house in no time she fancied these different warnings alluded to one and the same thing but what that might be she was totally at a loss to conjecture upon the return of her husband she told him of her mother's queer ways and insisted in a manner somewhat peremptory that he should tell her the short and the long of it at once for that she was determined she would know what they all meant the don shrugged his shoulders and did not seem disposed to reply with the readiness that was evidently expected from him he had in fact been very strictly charged by his father-in-law to say nothing to patty upon the accident which had occurred at big gang bank and he had tolerably well obeyed the injunction but the don hated difficulties of all kinds and he was beginning to doubt whether it was worth his while to run the risk of being taken up as a suspected character every time the major played with no better payment than being boarded and lodged it was now however very nearly the hour at which mrs simcoe had informed them she punctually dined and this was too sacred a ceremony in the opinion of don tornorino for it to be broken into by any discussion whatever he accordingly gave his fair bride to understand that whatever information it was his power to communicate must be postponed to a future opportunity and she had therefore bon gré mal gré to descend to the dining-room very completely mystified as to what her respected parents were about the major who also felt that he had barely time enough to make his toilette postponed all questionings of his wife for the moment merely finding time to tell her that he had negotiated mr hapford's bill without any difficulty and the family accordingly sat down to table together with considerably less unity of purpose than was usual with them 
the large and neatly served dinner-table of mrs simcoe was surrounded exclusive of our travellers and her gentle self by six american gentlemen and their six wives they were all of them at least according to the opinion of mrs allen barnaby and her daughter dressed more or less in the quaker costume the ladies being all habited with more attention to delicacy and neatness than either to fashion or splendour and the gentlemen having little or no mixture of the chain and pin species of decoration which usually distinguishes their countrymen the dress of mrs allen barnaby herself was also a model of propriety the slight and floating drapery usually worn upon her ample shoulders was exchanged for a close-fitting white satin cape trimmed with swan's down which though it caused her to endure sensations not very far removed from suffocation made her feel herself as she told the major afterwards quite of a piece with all the rest of them and much more likely to make her way among this straight-laced part of the population than if she had made herself fit to be seen in the ordinary manner this making herself fit to be seen by the way was a phrase which both in her daughter's vocabulary and her own appeared to signify the exposing as much of their persons to view as could be conveniently managed by any possible arrangement of the sleeves and corsage from which it may be inferred that they interpreted fit to be seen into ready to be seen a gloss accepted as it should seem by many of their fair countrywomen especially when preparing themselves for the dinner-table but whatever variations in fitness the fine judgment of my heroine might dictate and adopt according to circumstances no shadow of changing in this matter was perceptible in the toilette of her young daughter who came blazing into mrs simcoe's dining-room precisely in the dress which her thoughtful mamma had requested her not to wear and with such a remarkable deficiency of drapery about her shoulders that the gentle lady at the head of the table had a sore struggle with herself as to whether she should or should not send for a certain mouse-coloured shawl from the next room to supply what was so evidently wanted how this combat between meekness of spirit and severity of decorum might have ended if nothing had occurred to interrupt it i cannot say but the usually silent business of eating and drinking had not advanced far ere mrs allen barnaby bethought herself that however foreign to the manners of the country conversation at the dinner-table might be it was nevertheless her only chance at present for displaying those powers of mind upon which she rested her best hopes for continued success in the land to which fate and fortune had guided her steps having meditated for a moment or two as to how she should begin she said to a mild-looking quaker gentleman on her right may i ask you sir to be kind enough to tell me the name of the lady opposite to me sarah tompkins was the concise reply which certainly offered as little opportunity for continuing the conversation as any reply could do but mrs allen barnaby would never have been my heroine if such a difficulty as this could have checked her it did not check her for a single moment for she instantly replied that is not the name i expected for i fancied i had seen the lady before and that she was called maurice it is a most extraordinary likeness certainly how odd it is sir isn't it that sort of unaccountable resemblance that one sometimes sees between people in no way related to one another for if the lady is not mrs maurice herself i don't think there is any chance of her being her sister or cousin or anything of the sort because mrs maurice's family are altogether english and have never any of them emigrated to this country and so much the worse for them isn't it sir there never was such a glorious country as this and that is what i have said to my husband major allen barnaby every day since we have been here not indeed that he is in the least degree inclined to differ with me on the subject he admires the country and the charming people too with exactly the same enthusiasm as i do that is the major sir a little lower down on the other side with full grey whiskers a dear excellent good man he is and so fond of what he calls the elegant peacefulness of this population that if it was not for the rank he holds in the english army and when he goes back he must be constantly with the duke of wellington again if it was not for this he says he would certainly cut off his moustaches in order to look more like one of them the quaker gentleman gently nodded his head for about the sixth time since she had begun talking which seemed to be intended as a sort of civil assurance that he heard her but he uttered no sound save that inevitably produced by the act of eating mrs allen barnaby here paused for a moment that she might herself eat a few mouthfuls for she was exceedingly hungry but having done this with as little loss of time as possible she began again perhaps you are not aware sir of the peculiar interest which philadelphia in particular has for english people and for myself indeed beyond all others 
my object in coming to this country was solely to obtain information on the state of the slave population throughout the united states as i am engaged by the first publisher in london to write a work upon the subject the quaker gentleman on hearing these words crossed his knife and fork upon his plate and turned himself round so as to command the side front of mrs allen barnaby's person on perceiving the advantage she had gained she performed precisely the same evolution herself thereby bringing herself very satisfactorily face to face with the drab-coloured individual whom she wished to propitiate the art writing on the subject of slavery he said after looking at her steadily for a few seconds and speaking in a tone that seemed to express a doubt if he had rightly understood her yes my good sir she replied casting down her eyes with great modesty i have been urged to undertake the important task by a personal application of the very highest kind so high indeed that it would be inconsistent with etiquette did i particularize it further thee must be urged to the undertaking by higher authority than any the earth can show said the quaker gentleman with considerable solemnity and slightly raising his hand to indicate the region from whence it should come may i ask thee what are thy views upon the subject an inferior mind might have been daunted a little by these words and more still perhaps by the tone in which they were spoken but they produced no such effect on mrs allen barnaby on the contrary she felt her courage rise as she perceived that she was perfectly right in the ground she had taken and that she had nothing to do but adhere carefully to the plan she had so rapidly conceived in order to ensure for the future a degree of success fully as brilliant as that which she had already obtained she answered readily therefore but with her hand pressed upon her heart her eyes solemnly raised and her voice skilfully pitched to a tone of the deepest feeling my views sir are those of a reflecting christian that being the exact phrase which she had heard bitterly ridiculed by judge johnson when he was describing the cat of the abolitionists in that case thee art about to do what every good man's voice will be raised to bless thee for said the quaker gentleman if thee dost it friend to the best of thy power he added thee shalt find that let thy learning and thy skill in authorship be great or small thee shalt meet with the gratitude and good will of a very large body of the stranger people amidst whom thy holy purpose hath brought thee this concluding assurance was of course exceedingly welcome to the lady but nevertheless there was something in the quaker gentleman's allusion to the possibility of her not being an accomplished author which she did not quite approve and after a moment's reflection she said i would never dear sir have ventured to trust my pen on such a theme had not its earlier efforts been already approved in the most flattering manner by the best judges among my countrymen under my maiden name i have published many successful works but as my present object is not fame but utility i have determined by the advice of one of the most exalted characters in england both as to worth and station not to let the name under which i have published be known as long as i remain in this country my reason for this self-denying reserve is to be found in my earnest wish to see things exactly as they are without running the risk of having my judgment warped by the species of flattering adulation which literary fame is sure to produce in this enlightened country that the precaution was not unnecessary we have already found for being determined to see everything by my own eyes and judge everything by my own understanding i prevailed upon my beloved and most indulgent husband to let me land on our first arrival from england at new orleans that great stronghold of the abominable system that my soul abhors my honest wish was not to exaggerate in speaking of its effects and the only way of being sure to avoid this was by contemplating those effects with my own eyes but it unfortunately happened that there was a gentleman at new orleans who had seen me in europe and who recognized me as blank, as the author of the works to which i have alluded the consequence of which was that all the most important families in that part of the union came forward in a body to welcome me hoping as i suspect that i might lend a pen which has been acknowledged to have some power to advocating the atrocious system that reigns among them you may easily believe my dear sir that their advances were not very cordially received but of course i could not avoid hearing an immense quantity of argument in favour of the system and thee didst not find the arguments worth much he replied with a gentle smile worth mercy on me dear sir they made me perfectly sick and ill i never suffered so much from hearing people talk in my whole life before 
all this did not pass amidst the silence of an almost holy quaker dinner-table without attracting the attention of every one seated at it mrs simcoe forgot patty's distressing want of a shawl while she listened to the discourse of her more prudent mother and more completely still while observing the attention paid to it by her richest and in every way most important guest john williams the well-known quaker philanthropist this gentleman who had amassed a very handsome fortune as a philadelphian banker had for some years past fixed his residence at a handsome mansion at the distance of ten miles from the city making the boarding-house of mrs simcoe his well-esteemed cousin and friend his headquarters whenever he found occasion to revisit it this good man was not only in every way entitled to respect but possessed it so universally as to render the fact of his entering into conversation with mrs allen barnaby a reason amply sufficient to make every individual at the table both male and female desirous of conversing with her too the knives and forks were either laid aside entirely or else used so cautiously as to prevent any sound from that quarter interfering with the general wish of hearing what it was that the stout high-coloured english travelling lady could have to say that should make john williams listen to her with so much attention but not even this universal feeling of interest in what was going on could long postpone that strong american propensity to start up from the dinner-table as soon as hunger is appeased which renders that great luxury of european life table-talk almost unknown to them but this interruption ill-timed as it seemed to mrs allen barnaby at the moment was not sufficient to check the purpose of the good quaker to become without any delay better acquainted with her perhaps john williams had never in his life looked in the face of a lady which he felt less inclination to look at again than that of mrs allen barnaby but what did that signify john williams felt that it was his duty to make himself acquainted with her and it must therefore have been a very serious obstacle indeed which could have prevented his doing so with his usual quiet passive sort of decisiveness the worthy quaker immediately made up his mind as to the manner in which this was to be brought about and as soon as mrs simcoe rose a movement immediately followed by the rising of the whole party he walked round the table to the place occupied by his wife rachel with whom all his journeyings whether long or short were ever taken and said to her wife thee must come with me to ask yonder foreign lady to go to thy parlour with thee the tall stately prim-looking mrs williams instantly prepared to obey but not without fixing a glance of the most unequivocal astonishment at the individual to whose side she was summoned had she been the very dirtiest of negresses or the most wretched looking of whites no such feeling had been produced by it but it would have been difficult for her to have imagined a face and figure that she would have thought less likely to attract her spouse than those of the person she was now approaching as rapidly as the unchangeable sedateness of her pace would permit rachel williams said the good man as soon as he had succeeded in bringing the strangely matched pair face to face rachel williams i would have thee give the hand of sisterly fellowship to this stranger thee has not told me thy name he added addressing mrs allen barnaby how beest thou called my name replied our heroine with a smile and an attitude and an accent all intended to testify the extreme delight of this introduction my name is barnaby allen barnaby mrs major allen barnaby and most happy do i feel in being thus permitted to present myself to those who must be so able to afford me effectual assistance in the important object i have before me thee must come with us to our own quiet parlour said the good man offering his hand to lead her and when thee art there thee canst explain fully both to my wife and to me not only thy object but the means by which thee dost hope to accomplish it and then we shall be able to discover in what way we may best be able to help thee mrs allen barnaby's thanks were profuse and ardent and she yielded her plump hand to the thin fingers of the quaker with a flourish that she felt at her heart to be very like the manner in which she had once seen mrs siddons lay her palm on that of king duncan but just as they had reached the door with the fawn-coloured rachel following close behind it suddenly occurred to our heroine that it would be advisable that she should exchange a word or two with the rest of her party before she separated herself from them i beg your pardon my dearest sir a thousand times but you must if you please permit me to say one single word to my dear excellent husband before i retire with you to your own apartments does thee wish thy husband to come with us also demanded the amiable quaker oh no was the reply you are very kind excessively kind indeed 
but my good major knows the business to which i am devoting myself and as he has considerable confidence in me dear man he never interferes for fear as he kindly says that he should puzzle the cause by interrupting me but i just wish to say one word to him and to my daughter the lady of don tornorino to prevent her being surprised at my not returning with them to our own rooms surely surely replied john williams standing back with his wife to let the rest of the company pass out we will wait for thee till thou art ready for us thus sanctioned mrs allen barnaby stepped back and laying one hand on the arm of her husband and the other on that of her daughter she pushed them gently before her into the recess of a bow window and then said in a whisper winking a good deal first with one eye and then with the other in order to make them understand that she had more to say than it was convenient to speak at that moment i am going with these topping quakers into their sitting-room i shall get on with them never you fear good-bye and then glided back to her new friends and in the next moment passed through the door with them and was out of sight patty and her father stood staring at each other for a moment and then both laughed while the mystified don who understood only that his august mother-in-law was gone somewhere with a pair of the most incomprehensible people he had ever beheld and that they were forbidden to follow raised one of his black eyebrows to the very top of his yellow forehead and the other within half an inch of it while he waited till his wife had sufficiently recovered her gravity to reply to his somewhat petulant what for when at length the answer came however it was only in a repetition of his words what for darling i am sure i could not tell you if my life depended upon it unless it means that ma's gone mad no no patty said the major recovering his gravity do not alarm yourself ma is not gone mad i promise you but knows what she is about as well as any lady that ever lived but upon my life patty if we are all to sail in the wake of these prim quakers you must alter your rigging a little my dear or you'll be left out of the convoy and what's to happen then i sail in the wake of your detestable quakers exclaimed patty almost with a scream if there's any one thing on god's earth that i hate and abominate more than all the rest put together it is a quaker and if you think any of you that i mean to skewer myself up in a grey wrapper and go theeing and thowing to please them and that for the sake of getting a morsel of daily bread to eat you are mistaken this being uttered with a good deal of vehemence and an angry augmentation of colour while something that looked like tears glittered in her eyes her father instantly lost all disposition to mirth and replied in a tone of the most coaxing fondness what in the world have you got into your head my darling patty you can't suppose for a moment that i would let any body plague you to do what you did not like did i ever do it since you were born patty you know very well dearest that i never did and that i always think it worth while to battle for you whatever i may do for myself so for goodness sake don't begin to cry you know i can't bear it yes returned his handsome daughter with a sob i know all that very well papa i know that you have always been a great deal more good-natured to me than ever mamma was but that makes little or no difference now and i don't think it is at all right for married people to go on living as tornorino and i do just as if we were two tame cats kept to play with with a basket to sleep in milk to lap and a morsel of meat to mumble i don't like it at all and i don't think that don likes it at all better than i do the major probably knew by experience that when his patty was thoroughly out of humour it did not answer to argue with her and therefore without saying a single syllable by way of reply to the speech she had just uttered he tucked her arm with a sort of jocund air under his own and giving the don a good-humoured wink as he passed him led her out of the room saying come patty my dear we have got a sort of holiday this evening haven't we let us use it by going to the theatre i saw abundance of fine things advertised and i know you love a play to your heart nothing could have been more judicious than this proposal patty appeared to forget all her sorrows in a moment and springing forward with a bound that seemed to send her half-way up the stairs before its impulse was exhausted exclaimed that's the best thing you ever said in your life pap come along don i'd rather go to a play any time than be made a queen a few minutes quiet walking through the clean and orderly streets of philadelphia brought them to the handsome chestnut street theatre and a few minutes more found patty seated to her heart's content in the front row of a box very near the stage and her still dearly beloved don close beside her the major however who had taken his station behind could not control the spirit of busy activity which was ever at work within him beyond the first act he might pay himself for their tickets he thought at any rate if he could but find a billiard table 
and saying as he laid a hand upon the shoulder of both son and daughter you two can take care of one another he slid out of sight and escaped though the yellow-faced don was neither so young nor so fresh as his wife he enjoyed the amusement which he was thus peaceably left in possession of quite as much as she did the piece was beaumarchais and mozart's barbiere di Sevilla, adapted to the american stage and despite the doubtful improvement of sundry alterations the spaniard was in ecstasies he was himself by no means a bad performer on the flute and such a longing seized him as he watched the performer on that instrument who sat almost immediately under him once more to listen to his own notes upon it that for some minutes after the opera ended he was lost in reverie what is the matter with you tornarino said his delighted wife clapping her hands as she recollected that there was still another piece to be performed you don't enjoy it half as much as i do the don looked silently in her handsome face for about a minute and then said what should you say patty if the rest was whispered but whatever he said pleased her so well that the thoughts of it seemed to divide her attention with the gay afterpiece for she eagerly renewed the conversation at intervals during the whole time it lasted nor did the discussion thus begun end here it appeared to have equal charms for both it lasted them through their lingering walk back to mrs simcoe's kept them long awake after they retired to rest and was renewed the very moment they were awake in the morning the subject of these interesting conversations shall be explained hereafter end of chapter thirty chapters thirty one and thirty two of the barnabys in america by francis milton trollope this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty one a consultation between a quaker gentleman and his wife rachel they do not quite agree in opinion but rachel does as wives promise to do another consultation takes place about the same time between the don and his lady and another still between the major and his lady mrs allen barnaby pays a visit to her new friends john and rachel williams no sooner were john williams and his loving wife left to themselves by the departure of mrs allen barnaby after one of the longest and most confidential tea-drinkings ever indulged in than they exchanged looks full of pleasant meaning and while the gentle woman sat silent from habitual reverence to her husband the thoughtful man sat silent too for some short space feeling half afraid of committing a folly by expressing how very greatly he was pleased by the adventure which had befallen them at length however the smiling silence was broken by his saying tell me rachel without fear or favour what does thee think of our new acquaintance thus encouraged rachel williams meekly replied i rejoice because i see thee rejoice john williams at finding that one has come amongst us who takes to heart the cause of the oppressed negro but the joy of my own heart would be more full and my confidence in the promised good more firm if this help and aid came not in so gaudy a clothing besides i think not that it is quite seemly john williams to see a woman of such ripened age with ringlets and love-locks fluttering with every breeze that blows but if thee dost tell me that this is prejudice john williams it shall go hard with me but i will amend it and for the future see only the woman's purpose and not the woman no rachel no replied the worthy quaker i should be loath that thy dutiful submission to thy husband's word should be put to so hard a trial or that thy faithful love should cause thee thy honest judgment i like not the aged englishwoman's love-locks better than thee dost my good rachel but shall we quarrel with the help that the lord has sent us because it comes in a shape that is not comely to our eyes what need is there that this foreign woman writer should be as goodly and as gracious in my sight as thee art rachel with her looks we have little to do but trust me if she knows how to write she comes amongst us armed with a power which we who have a battle to fight would do wrong to treat lightly this power she frankly offers to range on our side and in my judgment it would be folly to reject it how it comes to pass i know not rachel continued john williams after pausing a minute or two in meditation but certain it is that notwithstanding all the abuse and belittling which the union from georgia to maine pours forth without ceasing against the old country notwithstanding all this there is not an english goose-quill that can be wagged about us right or wrong witty or dull powerful in wisdom or mawkish in folly but every man jonathan in the states is rampant as a hungry wolf that seeks his food till he gets hold of it and straightway it is devoured as if his life depended upon his swallowing the whole mess let him find it as nauseous as he may 
such being the case rachel it behoves those who like us have undertaken to fight the good fight in the cause of an oppressed race to welcome with joy and gladness the aid of every english pen likely to be bold enough to set down the truth in this matter if the best written treatise that ever was penned were to come forth to-morrow in favour of universal emancipation by john williams of philadelphia thee dost know right well rachel that it would only go to line trunks and wrap candles but if this curly-wigged fat lady verily and indeed sets to work and prints a volume or two about the enormities she has seen in the slave states and the christian good sense she will be able to listen to in the free ones we know at any rate that the books will be read and that is something rachel yes truly is it replied his faithful wife and woe betide the folly that would stop so godly a work because its agent came from a foreign land where old women wear unseemly headgear it shall not be thy wife john williams that shall show any such untimely attention to outward apparel thee speaks even as i expected to hear thee rachel after the first effect of this large lady's finery was passed off and now dear wife we will go on hand in hand together in helping and urging forward the good work such being the state in which mrs allen barnaby had left the minds of her quaker friends it scarcely need be doubted that with her penetrating powers of observation she took her leave of them extremely well satisfied with the result of her first philadelphian experiment it was not however without a pretty considerable degree of fatigue that she had reached the point at which she had aimed it is a wearying and in truth a very exhausting occupation to go on through a whole evening labouring to appear precisely what you are not and so perseveringly had mrs allen barnaby done this during the hours she had passed with the good quakers that when she reached her own room she could not resist the temptation of going immediately to bed and to sleep although the major was not yet returned from his search after sporting men and a billiard-table and although she felt not a little impatient to report progress to him but nature would have her way and for that night major allen barnaby heard nothing more from his admirable wife but her snoring less silent and less sleepy were the pair that occupied the chamber on the opposite side of the corridor it is quite time that the conversation which demonstrated the consequences of their evening at the theatre should now be recorded as the results which followed upon it came so quickly that i may otherwise be reduced to the necessity of narrating effects first and their causes after and if you will do just exactly what you have said my own beautiful darling exclaimed madame tornorino as soon as the door of their sleeping apartment was closed i will love and dote upon you as long as ever i live and won't we have fun don and won't we make the old ones stare and i say tornorino won't we enjoy eating and drinking and waking and sleeping without being obliged to care a cent for anybody and with money of our very own 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 without saying thank you for it to any mortal living won't it be fun torney i no contradict you ma belle returned tornarino it would be fun if fun means bien beau to do what we like sans contredit from nobody but we must think my beautiful patty vraiment we must think considerable before we give up the papa and the mamma in all that they have got to make us pardon quelque désagrément don't be an idiot don replied his animated wife upon my life and soul tornorino if you do turn out a coward and a fool i will run away from you as sure as my name is patty do you think i don't know the papa and the mamma as you call them better than you do and do you think i want to creep about half starved as you used to do in london my fine don not a bit of it i promise ye what the old ones have got i shall have you may depend upon that let me do what i will to affront them and i won't be kept in leading strings any longer i tell you so just choose between living with me or without me i will go on the stage tornorino that's the long and the short of it in one word if you choose to stand by me good that is what i shall like best because as you know i dote upon you so but if you plague me the least bit in the world by way of making me give up the scheme i'll run away from you before you can say jack robinson no 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 my petty beauty replied her husband with a very tender caress i shot myself directly if you run away your beauty from me i will indeed and will you let me go upon the stage without trying to coax me out of it said patty shaking her head expressively yes my angel i will 
only i would not have no pleasure at all if we were only to get on just as i did once before by myself when i tried in the orchestra of Dury lane i was very much near starving my patty said poor tornorino mournfully stuff and nonsense darling replied his wife you in the orchestra of Dury lane was one thing and i on the stage at philadelphia shall be another besides i tell you don that pap would no more bear to see me want anything than he would bear to want it himself mamma likes me well enough i believe and is as proud of me as a peacock is of his tail but pap is my sheet anchor and as i must know him rather better than you mr don i'll just beg you not to trouble me any more by talking of starvation and such like agreeable conversation for it's what i most abominate and i'll just trouble you to remember that if you please and never let me hear such a word again as long as you live the amiable tornorino did but mutter one little word or two under his breath which would have signified if interpreted that he thought he knew major allen barnaby as well as most people and then he pledged the honour of an hidalgo that his charming patty should never again be tormented by any vulgar doubts or fears on the subject of daily bread and then they proceeded to discuss in the most animated and agreeable manner what sort of dress would best become the fair debutante and this most important question decided that of character followed after in short half the night was passed in arranging the preliminaries of madame tornorino's appearance upon the philadelphian stage which she felt confident would terminate her tiresome dependence upon pa and ma and make both her fortune and fashion for ever pa and ma meanwhile were on their parts as meritoriously intent upon turning their talents to account as their enterprising daughter and the early dawn found them in very animated discussion about the best mode of effecting this the major had returned from his search after some opening in his own way in very ill humour with the noble city of philadelphia declaring that since he was born he had never seen such a collection of broad-brimmed quizzes and as to billiards they knew no more about it than so many children then you should be the more rejoiced my dear that i am likely to make a good thing of it replied his wife after very attentively listening to this melancholy account if they don't know much about billiards they do about books and the broad brims have their eyes open wide enough i promise you on the enormous importance of securing on their side a person who is master of the pen or mistress either my dear if you like the phrase better that is all vastly well mrs allen barnaby replied the major giving way to the rather strong feeling of ill-humour which his own abortive attempts had generated it is vastly well for you to strut and crow because you find a parcel of idiots ready to be gulled by all the rodomontade nonsense you are pleased to talk to them but will that enable us to go on living in the style we have lately been used to i never talk to you when you are in a passion my dear returned mrs allen barnaby composedly for i know it does not answer god knows my dear i don't want you to talk was the conjugal reply what i do want is that you should understand that i mean to be off and the sooner the better for the place seems to be about equally dull costly and unprofitable so you may set about packing as soon as you will i shall be ready to start to-morrow at the very latest mrs allen barnaby remained silent for a minute or two but the pause was not altogether occasioned by obedience to her husband's hint she was balancing in her able mind during the interval the comparative advantages of trusting to a good breakfast to ameliorate his ill-humour or of disregarding his uncourteous wish for silence and pouring forth upon him at once the brilliant history of her last night's success being a little afraid of him when he was in a passion which to do him justice did not often happen it is most likely that she would have chosen the former course had he not suddenly said when preparing to leave the room there is no good in mincing the matter i shall go at once and tell mrs simcoe that we don't much like the place and mean to be off to-morrow nay then i can keep silent no longer donny exclaimed my heroine in the most sidonian tone imaginable you know not what you say major you know not what you are about to do alas how weak and wilful is the mind of man how short how very short a time ago was it that you vowed you never would decide on anything without consulting me yet now because you find a society of black of gentlemen who might be quite as likely to win money as to lose it you resolutely tell me that you are determined to leave the place though i have every reason on earth to believe that i may speedily raise a very considerable sum here major allen barnaby was by no means the most unreasonable man in the world and therefore instead of bouncing out of the room upon hearing these reproaches he turned round while in the very act of leaving it and said with something almost approaching to a smile 
come along then wife sit down and tell me all about it at once but don't make it very long there's a good soul this uncivil restraint upon her eloquence was certainly painful nevertheless mrs allen barnaby knew better than to notice it nay she even complied with the rude condition upon which she had been permitted to unburden her full heart and did so as succinctly as possible only permitting herself after concluding her statement to say now then major allen barnaby i leave it to you to decide whether the chance of profit is greater from our remaining among these very particularly rich people who are ready to worship the very ground i tread upon or from our setting off again upon a wild goose chase in the hope of meeting some fool or other who may be cajoled into losing money to you i should vote for the staying beyond all doubt wife replied the mollified major if you could but contrive to make me see my way through all the theeing and thouing you have been so amusingly repeating to me and to the solid cash that you expect to find at the end of it we want the ready wife the cash the rhino the spanish wheels as they call their sprawling dollars and unless you can manage to clutch this i'll tell you fairly that i would not give a gooseberry for all their civility because my dear i don't know any stock in any land that i can buy into with it major allen barnaby replied his wife after having listened to him in resolute silence till he had ceased to speak wise as you are you don't know the value of ready money one bit better than i do that number one comes first i will know and number two let it be what it will comes a long way after it so you need not talk any more if you please about giving gooseberries in return for such breakfasts and dinners as we got at big gang bank but in justice to my own honest earnings i think it is but fair to remind you that you do love a good dinner major allen barnaby and that the getting it day after day as you did from the beauchamps and capital good lodgings into the bargain for nothing will save dollars if it does not make them all quite true mrs allen barnaby returned her spouse mimicking a little her sidonian dignity of tone but nevertheless you must please to observe that at this present moment we are not one single cent the richer for all your palavering with the slaveholders but that my little games of piquet and écarté have left their traces very comfortably in my pocket-book and much you would have enjoyed the comfort donny said his wife relaxing into a laugh if i had declined the poisoning and left you to abide the second settling of your play account with the honourable mr themistocles joseph john hapford yes my dear he replied returning her laugh your poisoning was first-rate and with all your preaching you may take my word for it and once for all wife without any more joking and squabbling about the matter you must make up your mind to understand that it won't suit my views to go on travelling through the country dressing as fine as lords and ladies and playing agreeable from morning to night without getting any more by it than just bed and board i am not so young as i was my good barnaby and i feel the necessity of looking forward a little and making up something like a purse against old age and a rainy day if i find that they are too much in my own way here i'll be off to madrid or to paris or baden-baden it's all one to me i really don't care the value of a straw in what kingdom of the earth i set up my coining machine but coin i must wife somewhere or other if you will be so obliging as to give me the pleasure of your company through all these possible ins and outs by sea and by land of course i shall be delighted but if you unhappily decline it and prefer remaining here writing books for and against negro slavery i am sorry to say it but i shall be under the necessity of sacrificing your charming society and setting off without you and your daughter sir said his wife not a little provoked at the tone of this long harangue may i take the liberty of asking if you intend to make her one of your travelling party why yes my dear i certainly think i shall tornarino is very useful to me and i rather suspect that he would think it more profitable to be in partnership with me than with you this is all waste of time major said his wife suddenly resuming her usual tone will you agree to allow me one day's trial with these quakers if the ready the cash the rhino the spanish wheels that you talk about do not appear tolerably ready and certain i will agree to set off with you in whatever direction you like to go only one day if i fail i will be ready to start by this time to-morrow then to this time to-morrow i give you he replied but remember my dear your proofs of success must be pretty substantial before i accept them agreed was her short reply and mrs simcoe's breakfast-bell making itself heard at the same moment they left their room together meeting the don and his lady on the top of the stairs 
and then with every appearance of family confidence and harmony they descended to the eating parlour together chapter thirty two mrs allen barnaby after an interval of doubt and dread secures the assistance of john williams and her literary affairs assume the most hopeful appearance friend rachel is a little uneasy notwithstanding that a general breakfast eating was performed at the usual american pace mrs allen barnaby was the first who had finished the meal and quitted the table the departure of one or two of the boarders had caused an alteration in the juxtaposition of those who remained and mrs allen barnaby was no longer seated next to her friend john williams but this change was by no means disagreeable to her she felt that the time for mere chit-chat was past however skilfully she might manage it and therefore rather rejoiced at than regretted the necessity of suffering the good quaker to eat his morning meal in peace yet even while divided by the whole length of the table from her new friends she had found means to propitiate further their good opinion by the greatly improved fashion of her garments during the whole of the conversation with her husband which has been recorded above her fingers had been notably and most ingeniously employed in altering a variety of little ornamental decorations which she thought were more elegant than prudent from her morning gown she abstracted every bow together with a deep trimming of very broad imitation black lace from the cape of it which left this addition to her grave-coloured silk dress of such very moderate dimensions as entirely to change its general effect and to give to her appearance a snug sort of succinct tidiness such as it had probably never exhibited before the cap she selected for the occasion was one which owed almost all of its barnabian grace to a very magnificent wreath of crimson roses which ran twiningly and caressingly round the front of it and these being removed by the simple operation of withdrawing a few pins left as decent a cap as any one would wish to see of her half-dozen luxuriously curling fronts she chose the least copious and the least curling and having bedewed it with water from a sponge induced its flowing meshes to repose themselves upon her forehead with a trim tranquillity that might have befitted a magdalen it was thus that she now encountered the friendly eyes of john williams and his wife rachel and as it never entered into the imagination of either of them that the foreign lady should have thus metamorphosed herself to please them they felt particularly the worthy rachel some disagreeable twinges of conscience at remembering the scoffing remarks that had been made on the love-locks when it now seemed evident that it must have been mere carelessness or accident rather than design which had occasioned the superfluous hair to flow so wantonly it was therefore with even more than the hoped-for degree of gentle kindness that mrs allen barnaby's proposal of paying them a visit in their own drawing-room was received and ten o'clock precisely was named as the hour at which they should be waiting to welcome her that mrs allen barnaby was punctual need not be doubted much indeed depended upon this interview if she failed now she felt that she was pledged to give up the authorship scheme from which she not only anticipated much substantial profit but which had already given her so much delightful gratification that the thought of abandoning it was inexpressibly painful to her feelings her hopes however so completely outweighed her fears that it was with a delightful consciousness of power and the most cheering anticipations of success that she gave her soft quaker-like tap-tap at the quaker's door Come in was uttered with the very gentlest of tones and in the next moment my greatly altered heroine stood in straight-haired comeliness before the meekly approving eyes of her new acquaintance the permission to wait on you thus early she began is a kindness for which i can hardly be sufficiently grateful for the work to which i have dedicated myself seems to press upon my conscience i feel as if i were not labouring with sufficient devotion and energy on that which may perhaps involve the happiness of thousands this is an awful consideration my dear friends they are right friend allen barnaby replied john williams it is in this manner that all those who meddle in so great an undertaking should feel it is not so much insensibility to their frightful sufferings which the poor negroes have to complain of as want of energy in the means adopted for their relief to tell us frankly and freely good friend what may be the difficulty or embarrassment which is most likely to impede thy progress and i pledge to thee the word of an honest man that if john williams can remove it it shall be removed these were not words to be listened to with indifference by mrs allen barnaby she was indeed considerably more delighted than she thought fitting to express she had no objection to appearing grateful for the support so kindly offered but she did not wish that the quiet quaker should perceive all the triumphant joy and gladness that she felt throbbing at her heart she had contrived to learn by one or two intelligent questions addressed to mrs simcoe's help 
that john williams had very ample power to remove all such embarrassments and difficulties as at present beset her and had he not now pledged his honourable quaker word to use in her behalf what power he had now then was the moment of projection as the chemists say now then was the very crisis of the experiment that was to prove whether she did indeed possess the precious secret by which palaver might be converted into gold or whether she must henceforth submit to the degrading position of a merely ornamental appendage to her more highly gifted husband's establishment she preluded the answer which was to settle this important question by a deep sigh and then bending forwards towards the little work-table which supported the scissors thimble cotton reel and narrow morsel of fine lawn upon which the neat-handed rachel had been employed when she entered she remained for a few seconds supporting her head upon her hand in silence had attention been wanting in her audience this piteous prelude would have been sure to command it and when at length she spoke not a syllable was lost on either john or rachel it is inexpressibly painful said mrs allen barnaby slowly raising herself from her bending attitude to submit oneself even to the dictates of duty when they command us to do or to say anything that may be misconstrued into alas how shall i find a word to express what i mean that shall not sound too harshly into abusing the generous kindness of those who stretch forth the hand of brotherly fellowship to assist us nay now friend barnaby i must not have thee speak thus interrupted john williams with the most expressive intonation of benevolence remember that thy work is our work and that thought will remove at once all such idle embarrassments as those thee speakest of oh true most true exclaimed mrs allen barnaby with renovated courage and as if suddenly conscious that she had no feelings of which to be ashamed but altogether the contrary never again will i give way to such weakness you will then my excellent friends listen to me as to a sister while i confess to you that my husband devoted to me as he is and kind too upon most points does not partake of the enthusiasm which has brought me to this noble but misguided country yea verily it is then as i feared rachel but take courage friend barnaby and think not that we shall be the less inclined to give thee assistance because we find thee wantest it more thee speakest well friend barnaby in calling this our misguided country noble and well pleased am i to find that thee hast clearness of judgment enough to see that it is indeed noble in simple truth friend barnaby it is the very noblest and most glorious country on the face of god's whole earth and thee knowest there are spots on the sun but progress progress good lady and let us know in what and how far it is that thy husband opposes thy purpose perhaps replied my heroine mildly opposes is too strong too harsh a word to use when speaking of the conduct of major allen barnaby the very indulgence which induced him to leave his own country where his highly exalted reputation gives him a position so peculiarly agreeable in order to gratify my wish in visiting this must for ever ensure my gratitude but the fact is that unfortunately he does not see this momentous question concerning negro emancipation in the same light that i do so strongly do we differ indeed that i am persuaded though if i publish upon it he will never come forward publicly to controvert my opinion yet that if i should not do so he would be exceedingly likely to write upon the other side indeed exclaimed john williams the smooth serenity of his countenance a little ruffled by the intelligence and does thee think him capable of writing a work likely to produce any great effect it is strange for his own wife and one who loves him too as dearly as i do to reply to such a question with regret because it is only possible to reply to it in the affirmative said she he has perhaps the most powerful talent of any man living in controversy his wit his eloquence oh it is something magical and like many others i believe who are thus gifted he certainly has pleasure in putting down what in this case he calls popular prejudice this is heavy news my good lady very heavy news i promise thee an european coming to this country and publishing a powerful book in favour of negro slavery will do the cause more harm than thee mayest think for the strongest weapon which we have got to use against the avarice of our misguided but high-minded countrymen is the universal condemnation of europe and anything tending to weaken that would be a misfortune indeed i am aware of it replied mrs allen barnaby with emphasis 
and this it is that makes me feel the importance of my own undertaking the major knows that i am employing myself in writing on this awful subject every detail of which harrows my very heart while he alas treats it all with most sad levity and he has told me very positively though i must say without the slightest harshness the good major is never harsh to me but he has told me that although he will never interfere to prevent my writing on this or any other subject for in truth he is foolishly proud of what i have done in that way yet that as he cannot agree with me in the views i have adopted he should hold himself inexcusably weak were he to permit any great expenditure of money in travelling about merely as he expressed it to enable me to strengthen my abolition prejudices upon his saying this which occurred when we were at new orleans i asked him if he would object to my spending a small sum not exceeding three hundred pounds which he knew i had by me as especially my own in travelling from city to city of this majestic country in order to become generally acquainted with it to this he frankly answered no he knew he said that the trifle i have mentioned was intended for the purpose of some sparkling ornament but that if i preferred seeing your gems of cities to looking upon gems of my own he saw no good reason to oppose me this sum my dear friends continued mrs allen barnaby is i grieve to say totally exhausted and i am under the terrible necessity of abandoning a work in which my very heart and soul are engaged or of submitting to the embarrassing alternative of confessing this fact to you and beseeching you to give me your opinion as to the possibility of raising by subscriptions for my forthcoming volumes such a sum as may enable me to continue my researches for as you will readily believe my principles forbid me to state facts with which i am unacquainted and if i cannot succeed in immediately raising a little money for the purpose of prosecuting my inquiries in the free states i shall be obliged to return immediately to england and instead of publishing my own work have to endure the intense mortification of witnessing the appearance of another of principles diametrically opposite tell me therefore my kind and excellent friends if you would conceive it would be possible for me to raise such a subscription as i speak of john williams and his wife listened to this animated but somewhat long harangue in the profoundest silence neither cough sneeze hem nor even audible breathing interrupted the deep stillness in which she had the advantage of speaking on ordinary occasions mrs allen barnaby would have been fully aware of the advantage this gave her for she by no means liked to be interrupted while speaking but now she almost felt that the stillness was too profound for it seemed even to communicate itself to the eyelids of her auditors which never winked the looks of john being steadily fixed upon her face and those of rachel as steadily directed to the carpet she almost feared to cease speaking lest this chilling atmosphere of stagnant silence should condense itself into an icy refusal but stop at last she must and did and then it took at least a minute ere john williams raised his voice to answer her her heart beat a good deal during this interval and she became anything in the world but sanguine as to the result nor was her acuteness altogether deceived as to the meaning of all this if there be a form of speech which will act like an incantation upon all alike and before which slaveholders and emancipationists calvinists and unitarians catholics and quakers yankees and creoles will all shrink with equal sensitiveness it is a demand for dollars on every other imaginable theme they may and probably will differ widely but on this they are unanimous mrs allen barnaby saw and felt this at her fingers ends but though this sensitive shrinking unquestionably was the first fruits of her eloquence it was not the only one neither was it the more lasting she had arranged her arguments with great skill and when as john williams examined and cross-examined her she recapitulated all the dangers which threatened the cause in which he was enlisted in case her object was defeated it was soon easy to see that her eloquence was gaining ground and his prudence losing it at this stage of the business john williams would have given a good deal if his wife would have but looked him in the face but she was as far as possible from doing any such thing making no other change in her attitude after mrs allen barnaby had finished her opening speech than what was absolutely necessary for the stretching out of her nice little white hand towards her nice little rosewood work-table and withdrawing thence the before-mentioned strip of lawn to the hemming of which she again addressed herself with a pertinacity of industry which rendered all hope of her raising her eyes from it most completely abortive thee hast made a statement that it gives me great pain to hear 
said john williams at length in a tone that instantly turned the thoughts of mrs allen barnaby towards her packing up and before he had uttered a second sentence she remembered with some satisfaction that she had taken very few things out of their travelling recesses and that if the worst came to the worst she should not have a great deal of trouble in getting ready to set off according to promise on the following morning but with all her acuteness mrs allen barnaby did not yet quite understand the nature of a philadelphian quaker the first feeling which displayed itself was naturally enough that which was common to every citizen of the great republic but there were others which lay deeper and which belonged both to the particular class and to the individual which in the race of conflicting feelings were most likely to come in conquerors at last but john williams though very far from being a dull man was nevertheless not a quick one and before he could fully make up his mind what he should say next his interesting visitor rose and assuming a look of very touching shyness said to give you pain in any way my good sir is the very last thing i would willingly do and believe me when i say that notwithstanding your evident unwillingness to enter actively into the business i feel the most perfect conviction of your good will to the cause and am grateful for your kindness though it cannot as i perceive be of a nature to serve me good morning mrs williams good morning my dear sir and thus saying she moved towards the door being in truth exceedingly desirous to get away that she might indulge in the utterance of a few of the animated expletives which she felt trembling on her tongue and set about packing as fast as she could but her interview with the quakers was not over yet the art over hasty friend barnaby said john williams interposing his tall upright person between his guest and the door in matters of business no one should ever be in a hurry sit thee down again friend sit thee down and let us talk this matter quietly over they did sit down again and they did talk the matter quietly over so quietly indeed so lengthily so step by step that the reader might have rather more than enough of it were i to repeat word for word all that was spoken on that occasion suffice it to say that affairs wore a very different aspect when at length mrs allen barnaby really did leave the room from what they did when she first attempted to do so one feature only of the interview remained unchanged rachel williams continued during the whole of it to maintain her industry and her silence never once lifting her eyes from her hemming and never once speaking a word talking of the passions of a quaker may to some people i believe appear like talking of the passions of a fish but people so thinking cannot be natives of philadelphia the honest broad-brimmed abhorrence of savoury and the hearty wish of bringing about a national abolition of it does decidedly amount in many instances to a passion in the beautiful city of grecian banks and flowery catalpas our quiet-seeming friend john williams was an instance of this though his wife rachel was not for while she could not choose but remember even if she had wished to forget it that it was the same person who was now making a plain and specific application for dollars that she had seen entering the dining-room the day before the very emblem of all that a sober-minded female ought not to be john himself had no room in his head or his heart for anything but the abolition question and actually trembled when his conscience reminded him of the risk he had at one moment run of suffering an ill-timed fit of avaricious caution to stifle an undertaking which promised such great advantage to the scheme that it was the first object of his life to advance it was therefore with a bright and triumphant eye that mrs allen barnaby met the inquiring glance of her husband upon encountering him in the retirement of their own apartment whither he had returned from an unprofitable morning stroll on purpose to receive her you need not speak my barnaby he exclaimed the moment he beheld her that you have succeeded is just as easy seen as that you have a pair of the most expressive eyes in the world and how in the world my darling woman have you contrived to screw money out of that parchment man i should be vastly sorry major if i thought that i should get no more than what my dear friend john williams will disburse himself though i have no fears either that he should fail me but my projects are a good deal more extended than that my dear as you may perceive if you will do me the favour of running your eye over this list of names the most wealthy the most respectable and the most influential in philadelphia as i beg to inform you she then drew forth a large sheet of paper which she displayed before him and on which were in truth inscribed about thirty of the first names of the city 
to these persons john williams had promised to apply for subscriptions to mrs allen barnaby's book giving her to understand as he wrote each down that on such an occasion she would be sure to receive a sum greatly exceeding the price of many copies for that he pledged himself to make them understand how vitally important to the undertaking was the raising a considerable sum at the moment a considerable sum i wonder what broad brim calls a considerable sum eh my dear have you any notion demanded the major with the saucy air of one not disposed to be easily contented he mentioned no figures whatever major i cannot say that he did replied mrs allen barnaby with a slight frown but upon my honour donny i don't think it would be wise just at present for us to stand out quarrelling with our bread and butter only because we think it just possible that the butter may not be thick enough i have no more idea of committing any such folly than i have of building a church my love so don't alarm yourself he replied not only just at present mrs allen barnaby but just for ever our calling and profession will be to catch what we can this is no bad trade depend upon it even among yankees if the capital brought to it has a good deal of sterling brass mixed with the gold of such a wit as yours my barnaby oh no i have no intention depend upon it of declining these quaker dollars nor can i express to you sufficiently my charming partner the admiration i feel for the brilliant versatility of your talents nor can i behold the bold not to say audacious approach towards puritanical attire which your appearance at this moment exhibits without feeling that my happy destiny has mated me with a mind worthy of union with my own this flourishing compliment which was accompanied by a low bow made the lady get up and place herself before the glass and as she stood there with her hands primly crossed before her both husband and wife laughed heartily after this little indulgence of light-heartedness the well-matched pair entered upon a business-like discussion of their immediate arrangements it was decided between them that patty should be bribed by some new article of finery to be worn elsewhere to make herself somewhat more decent in attire at the dinner-table and also that mrs allen barnaby herself should lay out a few cents in mouse-coloured ribbon and that the major and his martial moustache should keep out of the way on pretence of botanizing in order to avoid the too obvious incongruity of appearance between them this botanizing notion was due to the ready invention of my heroine and was rewarded by a fresh burst of conjugal admiration this very pleasant conversation ended by the major informing his wife that although he had no hope whatever of doing much during the time they might find it desirable to remain under the patronage of her quaker friends he was nevertheless not without hope of doing something for he had found out two public billiard-tables which though apparently carrying on business a little under the rose would enable him to pass his time without having to reproach himself with that worst of all possible faults idleness which in his case as she conscientiously observed would be worse than in that of most others inasmuch as he knew himself to be blessed with a degree of ability which rendered the employment of it a positive duty End of chapters thirty one and thirty two